Today we are in the Gospel of John chapter 10 and it is a lovely chapter to translate and there are quite a few variations. Sometimes there's not much but on this chapter there's quite a few variations of translation. I love the Word of God, I love the Lord Himself and remember the Lord says that heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away. And uh, in the end, when we finish translating, we put it all together. In fact, now I'm aiming to finish a New Testament, so that at least you got the New Testament uh, in LKJ, LKJV. <coughs> but, um, and then we will put the words of Jesus in red or whatever, or another color. I'm thinking of maybe in green or something pleasant to the eye. But uh, the words of Jesus are very important. And behind every sentence that he said, behind the words that he declared, they are full of God's life and there is a multiple wisdom. So sometimes when you gain the knowledge, you look back at what he said, you realize his context uh, much better. And sometimes you have words that are recorded in the Bible that says Jesus said it, like Paul in Acts chapter 20 when he says, uh, that the Lord says uh, that it is better to give than to receive. Throughout the whole Bible, you cannot find it. You cannot find it in the Gospels. And Paul must have remembered something Jesus spoke to him. And he, he converted uh, an experience that he had with Jesus where he has downloaded from Jesus and he remembered it as a word that Jesus spoke to him. So even the spoken words of Jesus unto us is very important. And it's only in this chapter, in verse 27, that Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. And in this chapter, I believe, is like the central theme of the Gospel of John. John presents Jesus, not just as the eagle, like the four creatures. John presents Jesus, <coughs> the shepherd. And there's so much words that John recorded. John 10, John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Then you wonder, the other Gospels didn't record all this. So there's a lot of things Jesus has spoken. And you wonder if He has spoken these things on four Gospels, what else is He speaking? The good news, He speaks today. And the reason why we are studying the Word is so that when he speaks, you can compare to what he has been speaking in the Bible. And the same Jesus will never contradict his own words. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Oh, we love your word. We love how your word transforms us. We love how your word cuts and separate spirit from soul, bone from marrow. Truly, your word is amazing. Your word goes into the depths of our DNA so that even Jeremiah in the Old Testament declare that your word burns like a fire in his bones. How much more today when we have Jesus in our heart and in our life. We ask, so, oh Father, that as we consider the words of Jesus, we may see you, Father, behind all the words. We may see God in all his fullness through every nuance of Jesus' words. So open the bread of life to us. Feed us your sheep tonight that your sheep may be transformed and grow to the fullness of Jesus. That your church will reach the fullness of the manifestations of the sons of God. We are your people in this last generation. We are the generation that see the fig tree bud. And you say, this generation shall not pass away until all these end time things take place. We are that generation. So we thank you from 1948 to 2048. This generation, 
they see the fig tree budding, the formation of Israel will see towards the end the coming of our Lord Jesus. So we thank you. We are the rapture generation. But sadly, Father, not every young person is raptured. Not every elderly person lengthen their life to see you through. But we pray more will come in. We pray, O oh God, and we continue to proclaim and claim two-thirds of the population on the earth. Because, Father, in heaven, two-thirds of angels stay true to you. One-third rebel. We humans want that record in our end time. Especially in these days when you so desirously share and demonstrate and bear witness to your word with signs and wonders. Thank you for your many angels. Reward them as they are faithful to help us. And bless them. Each time we have a breakthrough, bless the angels and reward them too. For they deserve it as much as us, O oh God, working invisibly behind the sin. We thank you, Father, for tonight. Let that word that you have specially for us be released, O oh God. Amen. That we may hear the voice of Jesus speaking as we consider his words. We give you, Father, all the glory, all the worship, all the honor. Amen. Always is due to you. May 24 hour praise and worship rise. In Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So, let's get this translation up for us. Yes, we have that. I love this chapter. I remember uh, from chapter 9 last week, there was a confrontation with the Jews. And he keep pointing to the Jews that the Jews are, are the sons of the devil. He really gave it to them. Hey, there's no other group that Jesus chastised, uh, really judge more than the Pharisees and the lawyers who are there. <coughs> If you remember, some of the Jews who actually were already uh, believing or who were with him, the Bible didn't say they were believers. Uh, the last two verses, the Pharisees who were with him said, Are we also blind? And then you thought Jesus would speak a kind word to them, but Jesus saw rebuke. If you were blind, you would have no sin. And now you say you see, your sin remains. So Jesus could tell the difference between true believers and false believers. It never said these Pharisees were believers. Although they were following Jesus closely, uh, they haven't really believed yet. And some of them, not all of them, because uh, there was a group that believed, I mean there was Nicodemus who believed in him. But there's some who didn't believe. And they, they cannot hide from Jesus. Jesus must have x-ray, see right into their heart, and he gave it to them. Because they were following Jesus without believing. Maybe they were just watching him. And that's why Jesus makes his converse, conversation and, and lengthy uh, dissertation <coughs> that he is the true shepherd. So let's look at that. Amen, amen, I say to you. And this is the literal translation. Because the Greek word is amen. <laughs> and uh, so when they translate into most assuredly, <laughs> You see how far it is? But literally Jesus said, Amen. And every time when Jesus said, Amen, Amen, I say to you, it's like he's about to release some nugget of wisdom <coughs> or some powerful words. And it prepares him. He says, He who enters not by the door into, uh, into the courtyard, I need to put the there in the courtyard, of the sheepfold, or into the courtyard of the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. So when I was translating that first verse already stunned me. Because he say, uh, he who does not enter the sheepfold. So when I say sheepfold, hey, they missed the Greek word. There was one more word that was totally not translated. <coughs> uh, no. See this, uh, uh, oh, chapter 10, verse 10, and, uh, okay, where is this? Okay, it's in Matthew, let's move it a bit, okay, synchronize now, yes, okay, 
I'm going to show you the side by side translation. Yeah, there it goes. Now, in the side, trans side by side translation, it says, uh, Can you see here this part in the Greek? I hope it's big enough. So it says, This is into the alu alen ton probaton. How can you have two sheepfold? See? Here translate sheepfold, here translate sheepfold. But this is not sheepfold. This is the sheepfold. Probaton. The place where they keep the sheep in. And this one is a courtyard. And I do have the footnotes there. And you can have a look at the footnote. I begin to find interesting things. I'm sure we're going to find more interesting things as we go to chapter 11, 12, 13, 14. But uh, uh, as we look in translation here, and 109 here, 109, uh, footnote 109. <laughs> it looks like you have the the glass, the the pointer turned into a big block of thing. <laughs> uh, let's see whether we can get 109 out. Ah, there. Hey. Uh, well, yes, you got it. You see the the uh, uh, outla, uh, outland, uh is a yard, is a word that means a yard, courtyard, hall, is also the word for palace. The other word, probaton, see probaton, it means sheep, it's from the word sheep or sheepfold. So they, they miss a section. What Jesus was saying, <coughs> He who does not enter, okay, I don't read this translation, let's read it. He who enters not by the door into the courtyard of the sheepfold, but climbs outside on the way. So there is actually a double protection. Like, uh, uh, there is a, let's say there is a place where you keep the sheep uh, at night. I guess that you would have a shelter. But the courtyard has no shelter. So the, there will be a, a courtyard, then there will be a sheepfold. And Jesus was not talking about the thief entering the sheepfold. I don't think the thief could enter the sheepfold. The, he said the thief enters the courtyard. And I guess the sheep would come to the courtyard in the daytime because you've got the sun and all that, unless they're out in the pasture. And then when they sleep, they will go into in the something with a shelter. That is the sheepfold. And this is the courtyard. <coughs> Depends on how many sheep, of course. Some sheepfolds don't have shelter, uh, that much shelter. But it was two places, not one place. And uh, so when I say, hey, that's interesting, we got a double layer of protection. And uh, the thief cannot just say, enter the sheepfold. I don't think the sheep could even enter the sheepfold. And uh, later we, 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 we look at that. But uh, <coughs> Because, uh, and then there's, there are two doors. That means there's a door to the courtyard, and there's a door to the ship, the, the ship hole. Two doors, not one door. And a two door place is much more secure. So the enemy uh, tries to go into the courtyard, uh, and uh, that would not, Jesus says, uh, if they come in any other way, is a thief and a robber. Instead of entering to the door or the gate, they would try to climb over to every other means, and that's not counted. Uh, Jesus said, He that is a shepherd, uh, you have to enter into the right way. Actually, that talks about protocol. I want to emphasize about protocol or the right way of doing things. We humans, especially in this end time, uh, you know, I have a book on uh, etiquette. Etiquette is how you sit, how you, uh, which fork you use first at the dining table, and uh, sittings and all that. They're small, little, tiny, refined things. The angels are very, very, very aware of that. Which is why many of us don't realize how angels work. They are sensitive to uh, the slightest thing. Sometimes, uh, like an angel want to appear to you, your reaction it could be emotional or different things. 
and then suddenly the whole process stopped. Not because they are sensitive in a sensitive sense of the human, but because they're sensitive to the pro protocol. Let's say if, if you go this September and you're praying in the Mount Nebo, which happened to one person before, I think that was the year, hmm, could be 2012, 2012, <coughs> when we were there. And then, uh, I think it's the wife of the first seven dynasty she's looking up at the stars, because when you pray at Mount Nebo, then she saw this light keep coming nearer and nearer and nearer. But as the light keep coming nearer and nearer, she had a fright. She, she began to be frightened. The moment she was frightened, the whole thing stopped. So, some of us wonder, why is that so small? So small. I mean, to the human being, you know, uh, we still go ahead and do whatever we need to do. But angels are sensitive to protocol. Protocol. Because protocol is their heavenly way of politeness. And so that sometimes in the year 2014, <coughs> is it 2014? Uh, it could be 2012. 2012, uh, after we left, uh, uh, there was a lot of downloads that come. And then when, when a download is of a certain thing, uh, one saint, uh, when a person is having, having experience, God will appoint a saint to talk to him. Let's say Jeremiah. Then when it comes to another area, another person. Even though that other person probably know these things. But they're so protocol that, okay, that is not my department, now it's time for the next one. But everyone got their own specialty. <clears throat> and God recognized all those things. So it has to do with protocol. When you do it the proper way, <clears throat> there's always a right way to do something. We, we are only, <clears throat> in humans, the end justify the means. They don't care about the method. But to God, the, the mean, the end, the means, every section is important. And of course, timing. If you, f if you do something that is not in the right flow, it's very jarring in the, in the realm of the spiritual. I guess the angel coming down to appear must have felt the waves and waves of fear. Always to humans so little. And then they stop the whole process. So we must build ourselves so that we are full of faith. Okay, I better go on because that. Uh, it's, but also, it's only about 40 odd verses. Um, he who enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. It's of course our Lord. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own by name. Name, he knows your name and leads them out. This is a very personal thing. He knows every one of us by name. Although he might speak in a heavenly language, we hear it in English. And uh, it is interesting to know what name God choose to call you when God calls you. If some of you might have heard in the morning or at times you heard like your name being called. Usually it's repeated twice. I don't know why it's always twice. Samuel, Samuel, <coughs> and uh, something like that. <coughs> so, uh, he knows each one of our name. And um, uh, one of my Bible school friends in Baptist Seminary, uh, when he went in, he's on Saraman. And his name, I think, is uh, his name is Lim, his surname is Lim, and he got a, uh, he got a, two two Chinese names besides surname. So when I asked him, why do you introduce yourself with your middle name? He used his middle name. And so he told me the story of how when he came to the ministry, he heard the Lord calling his name by the middle name. 
very strange. Call him by the middle name. Something like Yong. Kind of something like I, I, I want to. That is not his name, but something like Yong. Say, huh? And then when he went, then he realized there's a Lord calling. So the Lord might choose to call you by a certain name. Uh, and uh, because he knows you best. But he knows you by name and leads them out. So he takes you out into the courtyard, from the sheep for the courtyard, and then from the courtyard he takes you out. There is two doors, I realize. And when he brings out his own sheep, now let's see what the sheep is doing on that one. And uh, yeah, he also said he brings them, leads them out, brings them out. Actually, see, one of the things I don't like is how they keep changing the translation. And he brings, he leads. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, here he calls his sheep. And uh, so here is, uh, he, he brings them out, brings, brings them out his own sheep. He goes before them and the sheep, he goes in front of you. Look at all the tenderness. He knows you by name. There are two doors that protect you. And both are him. He knows you by name. He protects you with a double door. He knows you by name. He, he, he leads you out personally, which is by name. And uh, you hear his voice. You hear his voice. He leads you out by name. He goes before them. He's in front. And the ship is behind. So Jesus actually makes the way open before you. There's no more danger. Once Jesus passed through, there's no more danger. So He actually walks in front of us. And when you walk with the Lord, don't walk in front of Him. Walk behind Him. If you want to walk close, you can walk beside. But don't walk in front of him. <clears throat> the Lord prefers to be the one who leads us. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. This is an intimate relationship. And a stranger, they were, again, a double negative. Verse 5, here, yeah, can we bring it up? Yeah. And a stranger, they will never, ever, they will never, ever follow. And the old translation, they were by no means, they always translate the never, ever to by no means. Uh, but actually, it's uh, never, ever is a double negative. <clears throat> I translate double negative in Logos KJV as never, ever. F never, ever follow. Uh, but will flee from him. Hey, they run away from strangers. For they know not the voice of strangers. See that? Yeah, hey, there's a strange voice there. And so they, they do two things. They know the voice of Jesus. And they also know the voice of the stranger. When I look at these simple five verses, a lot of the modern Christians are disqualified. Firstly, when you talk to a modern Christian, we all agree we are sheep. Meh. Right? We know we are sheep. Meh. And then the next question is, do you know when Jesus speaks to you, they also cannot hear His voice. And the voice of strangers, they, also, they might just simply follow. So something is wrong with the sheep. If you cannot hear God's voice, actually, it's not too bad, not too far wrong. They are not sheep. They are lambs. Because the baby lamb have not learned to hear the voice of the shepherd. And so, instead of being his sheep, we are his lambs. And Jesus did say to feed both when he told Peter three times, Do you love me? And he said, Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Ah, he included. There's a difference between lamb and sheep. Just as there's a difference between chicks and chicken. 
They're different. <clears throat> we need to know that if you are hearing this message tonight and you still cannot hear the voice of Jesus, you're classified as a lamb because his sheep hear his voice. Just make sure the enemy don't make you into lamb chops. Survive, grow, be protected until you recognize the shepherd's voice. So how, who do lambs follow? Other sheep. The lambs will follow other sheep until they learn to hear the voice. <coughs> this parable Jesus spoke to them, but they understood not the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Wow, this shepherd thing continues. Jesus said to them again, and this time, just now he said, I am the shepherd. Now, he goes further. Amen, amen, I say to you. I am the door of the sheep. Now, he's also the door. He's the door, and he's the shepherd. But the door and the shepherd are like two different things. The door is the proper way to go. When he says it's the door, he's saying that every place you go, you must go through him. In and out, he is the door. He is also the shepherd. So how can he be the door and the shepherd at the same time? He is the one who opens a door and no one closes. Who closes the door and no one can open. Always depend on Jesus and hear where he's opening the door. In the fullness of time, he opens the door. Then he said, wow, what a statement. All that came before me, that means uh, in the past, especially the Pharisees, are thieves and robbers. Now, you know who he's referring to when he talks about thieves and robbers? And the hireling? The Pharisee. Now this parable, again, he's hitting them hard. He says, they are thieves. People will be thinking, who is the thief he's talking about? It's them. They are robbing the sheep, killing the sheep, fleecing the sheep, eating the sheep. <laughs> they are the robbers and the thieves. Jesus considered that. Remember, this is in the context of him rebuking the Pharisee. So we will say, watch out for robbers and thieves. He says, but the sheep did not hear them. Then who is hearing them? The goats. The sheep doesn't hear him, hear the robber. Because Jesus will say, you know, you call the sheep by name. Ah, the robber will say, ah, and, then, and then the sheep doesn't know which one. Cannot, the sheep knows. So when the enemy tried to imitate Jesus, ah, and you hear, ah, that's not Jesus. Because they're also trying to imitate. And he says, they are thieves and robber. The sheep did not hear them. She doesn't, the, the sheep just does not hear them. It is a different frequency. That's why only those who can let those who can, can hear what the Spirit is saying. He who has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Do you know that the gift of hearing is given by the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit gives you the gift of hearing. His gentle voice. Remember that you can hear. And Jesus emphasized again. Here he said, I am the door. I am the door, Jesus says. If anyone enter in by me, he will be safe and will go in and out and find pasture. You know, it's like this part, you go in and out, in and out. 
They talk about protecting us all the time. From the time, now every day you are in Jesus. And then you go out to do whatever you need. And you go return home, it is back to Jesus. So tonight when you sleep on your bed or wherever you're sleeping, remember, it is not your physical home you're going back to. Every night, go back to the fall. Go back to Jesus. He is the door you go in and out. But every time we think Jesus is somewhere else, when every night when you sleep, your last thoughts are, Jesus. Your first thoughts, Jesus. When you're going out, Jesus. When you're coming in, Jesus. Because that's the code word, He's the door. So some of us, when we go back, our last thoughts are not Jesus. Your last thoughts could be McDonald's, KFC, something else. No, your last thoughts, when he, when he tucked you nicely into the sheepfold, is Jesus. If you have that consciousness, the experience comes more and more. They will go in and out every day. This is a daily experience. See, some of us, we think that after you're saved, Jesus keeps you in the sheepfold. So you're like, you're like packed into the sheepfold. Cannot move. And, and you're waiting and waiting and waiting. And you say, what are you waiting for? Oh, waiting for the rapture. <laughs> oh, you're waiting and waiting and waiting. No, you're supposed to go in and out. You're not there, no all pack, jam pack, you know, uh, like you call sardine pack. <laughs> you know, after you're safe, you're just there, and the sheep man don't dare to go out. Man. Yeah, worse than kiasu, kian kia. <laughs> you know, really scared sheep. You know, afraid of going out. But you're supposed to go out every day because <laughs> if the sheep don't go out, the quality of your meat and everything goes down. <clears throat> But every day the sheep must go out and eat what? The sheep food is for sleeping. Eating is outside. So you must go out and you go and munch the grass where the shepherd will bring you. And then after you've eaten full, the shepherd brings you back in. It's always in front of you. So we must be brave. It must be people willing to go where Jesus tells you to go. Then again, he talks about the thief. The thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life. And that they might have it more abundantly. Peresos. Super abundant in quantity and in quality exceeding abundant beyond measurement so this is abundant what life and this is god's kind of life i translate it z o e god's kind of life spiritual life from god we have an abundance of life so much life every day when you wake up and abundant. He doesn't just give you a little bit. He gives you lots and lots of life. And that life can be converted into many things. Now he says some more thing about himself. I am the good shepherd. Beautifully good. Carlos. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So actually he is giving his life. Uh, there is a play on Greek word within the next few sentences. It says, But he who is a hireling, someone who only works for themselves and wages, they don't care for the sheep, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, he doesn't feel responsible for the sheep or ownership, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flee 
and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The wolf comes. Here's an interesting thing when Paul said in the book of Acts chapter 20, he told the church in Ephesus. And here he gathered the elders in a place called Miletus, which is, see from Miletus he sent to Ephesus. Remember Ephesus, his ministry ended, there was all opposition. So there was a town hall thing, and there was a, like a riot kind of thing, and then he has to leave. Uh, he called for the elders of the Ephesian church, and then he talked about um, how he served them, he was saying his last good, goodbye to them, and uh, he says uh, so that he can finish his race with joy, he's been preaching the gospel of God, and then he says this, verse 29, look at it, I know this, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves will rise up, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw disciples away after themselves. Now do you know why the sheep cannot come uh, the, the wolf cannot come as long as Paul was there. Correct? He said, once I'm gone, the wolf will try to come. Because, not just because he has authority. Of course he has. Because he was, the, he was like Jesus. He owned the sheep. He cared for the sheep. He didn't take it as a job. He really loved his sheep. And own, he has to be a shepherd like Jesus. He was a shepherd like Jesus, really caring for the sheep. And after Paul left the church in Ephesus, the next generation of leaders did not care as much. That's why the wolf came. Why do wolves come in? Because only hirelings are left. People who only work for salary. So the wolves are not afraid of them. But the shepherd who guards his sheep like the way David guarded his sheep. You know when David went against the lion and the bear, he counted the sheep life more important than his life. Because how many people go and wrestle a lion or bear to free a sheep? Most of the time you say, okay, and now one loss, I still got 99. <laughs> but Jesus will go after the one. The one. Of course, the nine day are nine already safe. That's, that's a true shepherd. So when we look at John chapter 10, the circumstances by which uh, the wolf come. He, does, he doesn't chase the wolf away. See that? The hireling, the one who works for wages, is not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees, he sees the wolf coming. The moment the wolf comes, ah, he runs. And then the wolf gets the sheep. So now, you know why the wolf did not come when Paul was in charge. He was chasing the wolf. Because the wolf will be trying to come in his time also. But he stood up as a true shepherd and says, challenge the wolf. So the wolf cannot come. Somebody must challenge the wolf. Somebody must stand up and tell the wolf, you cannot come nearer. The moment you leave, the wolf comes. Paul says, I know when I depart, the wolf will come. That means there was no one who cared for the sheep enough that they will stand against the wolf. So now we know. You can protect your family. You can protect your loved ones. You can protect your disciples whom you're in charge of. By 
chasing the wolf that try to go after them. Do you know that your prayers can protect your family? Your prayers can stop bad things from happening? Because you are the shepherd. Especially if you got spiritual authority. May I say something now? Many Christian homes, the husbands are not playing their role as the protector. And by protector, I don't mean like what some people abuse the Bible verse. I'm the head and, you know, of this home and they're very abusive. They're very abusive. I'm not talking about abusing your authority. The authority was not given to you to abuse. The authority was given to, for you to protect. You use your authority against the wolf. Not use your authority against your sheep. Listen, the dog! Listen! Hey, that authority, you know, shout anything, shout at the wolf. Because the sheep, uh, you shout at them, uh, the sheep was scattered. The sheep are so gentle. And, and I know because I talked to a farmer in Canberra. Around Canberra, there's a lot of farms. And this was a cattleman, herdsman, and a farmer. And uh, he used to work in a farm. Uh, and so from time to time, I meet him, and then he says, uh, so he used to tell me about sh the sheep that he had, or he's in charge of. Then one fine day, is, I asked him, you know, yeah, how's the sheep going? He said, no more sheep. He said, what, what happened? He said, oh, all, you know, sold or, or, or slaughtered, whatever. <laughs> they sold or slaughtered. They changed to cattle, you know, beef. And I said, why? He says, easier to take care. Sheep man, really take a lot of attention. Not so easy to take care. You have to be gentle with them. There we have it. Why the wolf came? We also discovered why the wolf came. Because the wolf is coming all the time. You think, oh, Paul around, the wolf doesn't come. It's not because Paul is around. It's because Paul was chasing the wolf. And protecting the people. Covering the people in prayer. It's our responsibility. And, oh, I was last day about many Christians' home. The, the husband or the father is not using the spiritual authority to protect their family and children. And then you can protect them without your family knowing also, by your prayer and by your confession over them. And then if you begin to open your mouth and speak negative things, open the door for the enemy because you're the head of the home it's just like the leader of a country say I surrender oh no <laughs> there cannot be accident one because that goes down the line the whole country becomes uh, you know uh, defeated it's important and so a lot of protection is not being done by the supposed head of the home as a result, some dear housewife, you know, who has to try to protect themselves, and then the housewife might already have a baby, you know, two babies maybe, and then they have to have a rod at the same time, beating the wolf away, wolf try to come, and the husband is back home, you know, couch potato. Doing nothing. And then every time they got a problem, blame, blame the, the wife or the mother, well, actually, the blame is on himself. If he had taken his place and chased the wolf away, you know, they would be protected. So you can protect your home and family by exercising spiritual authority, by confessing over their life, confess blessing over their life, confess good things over their life, straight away and lay your shield is over them. Just like the way we, we have been strengthening the Archangel of UK and Archangel of Europe, we tie the bonds between them so tightly, say it will never happen, we declare. 
And so we continue. That sometimes that God expects us to exercise our spiritual authority. So there you go. The, the wolf catches them, scatters the sheep, poor thing. The hireling flee because he's a hireling, Jesus says. He's only interested in the money and cares not for the sheep. Then Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep. But the best part is, and am known by my own. We know him. You know, here's a two-way relationship. I know them. They know me. Do you know Jesus? How well do you know Jesus? Which is why if you are a young Christian or you're a Christian and no one has actually told you how to read the Bible, and you thought as a Christian, you always start from the beginning like a book. And, you know, you're born again, you start from Genesis. In the beginning was, in the beginning God created the whole heavens and the earth. It's so sound interesting. And you go through Adam and Eve, and uh, then you go through all the stories of all the earlier patriarchs. Then you got Abraham, you got Isaac, you got Jacob, and then towards the end, then you look Exodus. Wow, not bad. Oh, not bad. Wow, exciting. Wow, 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 nice. Wow, Pharaoh going up and down. Then after that, after Exodus, then you go Leviticus. Ha, 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 ha. Bible reading finished. <laughs> you never read again. I always advise people, when you're a young believer, or even now if you could be a very experienced believer, and you've never read the Bible properly, you know the first thing you must master? The Gospels. You must ingrain yourself in every word Jesus spoke, everything Jesus did, because He saved you. So you must get to know Jesus in all His fullness, in every way. Since, since you're still learning to hear His voice, at least read the Bible, read the Gospels. Read through over and over again, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, oh, read through and read through and read through and read through until you reach a certain level where your knowledge of Jesus and your knowledge about Jesus and your, your, your intimacy with Jesus is so great, then you can go to read other things. And you can read some of the epistle, some of the Old Testament. So then you can begin to read other, and then you find it, you already establish your foundation. So the first thing is always get to know Jesus. And, and then of course I recommend the epistles before you go to the Old Testament. So here we have, and it's okay even if you spend quite a few years in the New Testament. What are the things that you might notice about um, Sadhu Sundar Singh is that a lot of his reading and a lot of his preaching, parable-like preaching, all come from the New Testament. There's a little bit here and there, then he talk about Old Testament, but most of them all New Testament. I guess that must be his focus for quite some time. So it's okay, even you become a master of the New Testament first, before you go to Old Testament. I am known by my own, that's important. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my... When I was translating, huh? So, then I say, huh? Then I quickly check the original translation, and it says, and I lay down my life. Cannot. The word life comes from the word Z-O-E, Zoe. The word so comes from the word P-S-U-C-H-E, Suke. Two different words. So I say, then why did they talk about life? And then when I saw this part, I say, okay, Jesus must be telling us something here. He says, I lay down my soul for the sheep. His soul. His priority, everything that he, 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 you know, the soul is always about himself, yourself, your self-consciousness. He laid it down. He prioritized the sheep. And let's read on, because this part is not getting important in verse 16. And let's move that up, thank you. And other sheep 
I have or this part talk about us. See, I lost others of the same kind, those who are born again, as opposed to heteros, others of a different kind. And this is a prophecy about the Gentiles. See, he was dealing with the Jews, then the Gentiles. So he says, other sheep I have, which are not of this courtyard. Ha! He used the word courtyard. Not of this courtyard, and the old translation is of this fold. There, yeah? of this fold, they translate it. But it should be courtyard. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and they shall be one flock, one shepherd, and actually, the word one flock also can be one fold, because it comes from the thing. Uh, see, one flock, one shepherd. Then I understood. It says here, who are not of this courtyard. Ha! There are many courtyards. But there is only one sheepfold. So the courtyard is interesting. Because the courtyard seems to be different customs for different courtyards. But the sheepfold is the same sheepfold. Say, other sheep I have. But they are not from this courtyard. They are from another courtyard. That's interesting. There is one sheep full, but many courtyards. Never saw that before. And Jesus was trying to say that there are differences in the sheep. But when it comes to salvation and all that, only one. So your, the courtyard is cultural differences, mannerism, and everything, but I say they are from the same kind of sheep. So internally, everyone is predestined to be like Jesus. Therefore, for this cause, my Father loves me, because I lay down my soul that I might take it again. Can you see that Jesus has full control of his soul? Perfect control. The soul consists of the emotions, the mind, and the will. Again, he says, no one takes it from me, and I, but I lay it down on myself, talking about his soul, not his life. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my father. Now we're going to contrast. When he talks about the soul, he says the soul is put down. He lay down his soul. When it came to his life, he gave his life. Look at the difference. And uh, the beginning part, and you contrast him as a good shepherd. And uh, says, uh, I come, and the good shepherd uh, is here. Us. And, okay, let's read the early part, okay. Here he is. <clears throat> and he explains, I'm the door of the sheep, all who came before me are thieves, robbers, I'm the door. And no one, he, everyone got to go through him. Then he says in verse 10, let's look at verse 10 here. Says, the thief come out of him to destroy, I am come that they may have life. And then the next verse, the shepherd gave his life. So his life is for sharing, but his soul was for putting down. Two different things. Which tells us something about the spirit and the soul in this part. Your, you can share your spirit, but your soul, you must be fully in control. To put it down, or to take it out. Two different things. The spiritual level is where you can impart. Jesus was giving his life abundantly. Spiritual life. All of us can share spiritual life. 
When you pray for one another, when you fellowship, when you talk, your spiritual life is being shared. Your, your relationship with God and all the energy that you got in prayer will come forth to bless people. But your soul is not so freely shared. That's why the only place where the souls are shared is soulmates, husbands and wives. The soul is different from the spirit. Now, in the Bible, David was also a type of friend soulmate with his best friend Jonathan. So there are some people you can share your soul. But with everyone, you can share your spirit. Know the difference. Your soul cannot simply share. Person must come to a certain level. Now, I know in the book of Acts, they say they are of one soul. Because the church was very united. Your soul must be guarded. And that's what happened to people in their soul. Their soul got no barriers. And that's why their soul so easily get depressed, so easily get hurt. Because what's in your soul? Emotion, intellect, and their will. So, your soul you must always guard with authority. So you do not allow your soul to be hurt. Do not let your soul be polluted by wrong thinking, or wrong teaching. Do not let your soul be influenced by people so that you choose wrongly. Which is what the Bible says in the book of Psalm chapter 1. It tells us, do not go and stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of the scornful. Correct. The sharing of the soul. Because it's your soul that can pull you down. Because when another person's soul joins with your soul, it can pull you down. But wait, you can always pull them up by your spirit. Can Paul differentiate between his spirit and soul? Yes. In the book of Romans 1, he talked about how he desired to come so that his spirit can impart something to them. He knows that he can impart something in the spirit from his spiritual level. But he never impart from the soul. Some people cannot differentiate between soul and spirit. And you can tell, sometimes people try to impart through their soulish manner. Like for example, when a person leads song, they can either preach from their soul, uh, sing from their soul or sing from their spirit. When a person preach or share, you can either do it from your soul or from your spirit. You always do it through your spirit. And soul is more like friendship type of domain. Uh, it is a different domain. Because the soul must always be under authority. You lay down your soul. If you have not laid down your soul, then you might be a soulish person. That came out in John 10. I was very surprised that, you know, suddenly it, it, it stands out. And Jesus talked about laying down his own soul. Let's look again, verse uh, 17. Having made that statement. Are we progressing? Good. Okay. Therefore, for this cause, my father loves me. Father loves him. Because I lay down my soul. He lay down his soul and these are always in the soul let me show you I'm talking about the love of the father first john 2 in first john 2 it tells us uh, <clears throat> okay here verse 15 do not love the world 
all the things in the world. You know what? What will make you love the world and the things of the world? Your soul. You think your spirit is interested in all this natural thing? No, it's not. It's your soul. Whenever you know you sometimes go and eat and all that, and you should, you don't have to pray in tongues one hour to dis, uh, to decide your lunch. You eat your lunch based on your yearning desire, your body sends you signal, your soul sends you signal. But the spirit, mm, the spirit might guide you in terms of knowledge and wisdom of God, foods and all that, which of good food, vitamins and everything. Uh, but your soul is the one who decides the food you eat for your body. The things in the world, all you relate to your soul. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. That is why we need to put down the soul. Surrender your soul to God. Verse oh, chapter 10, we are in verse 17. He says he has exousia. Exousia is authority. He got, he got full control over his soul. And decision to lay it down, to raise it up again. Because the Jews, in verse 19, the Jews, there was a division, therefore, again, among the Jews for this Logos. Now remember, Logos can divide your spirit and soul. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Logos of God is sharper than to his son. Many of them said, ah, here they go again, he has a demon and he's mad. Why do we hear him? Why do you hear him? Others said, these are not the rhema of one who has a demon. Can the demon open the eyes of the blind? So again, remember the last week, the blind story is still affecting some of them. Because it was the miracle that made them think twice. The others are better than the many. The many are saying, he has a demon. But the others are saying, mm, cannot be. The two doesn't go together. How, how can one who is a demon go and heal a blind man? Then, with the blind man in front of them, how can they say he is a demon? Funny. They have no more logic, actually. It's obvious that the demon cannot give the person sight. And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and I do a little explanation of what dedication here in uh, this little was. It's, uh, it's usually around Christmas time. It's like uh, Hanukkah that they celebrated, which is uh, sometimes in December, sometimes in late uh, November, 25th day of Kislev. And the uh, tradition was, uh, it's a real thing that happened. In 168 uh, BC, Antonius Epiphanes sacrificed a pig. <laughs> Terrible. And then a uh, few years later, Judas Maccabees uh, have to clean the whole thing and rededicate the temple to God. So, so Antonius Epiphanes actually did desecration. It was a prophetic type that was there. But that feast continued to be celebrated. It is almost like the Jewish Christmas kind of thing, uh, Hanukkah. And it was winter, you see, every time it's winter, which is why when in winter the sheep are not out, which is why Jesus is actually not born in December. He's born when the sheep are out grazing, most likely in spring. And then another place is Jesus walked in a temple, in Solomon's porch, and I describe also here because it's important for you to visualize. Uh, when they build the temple, 
there was a, a section towards the eastern side uh, where they built like a beautiful courtyard and it's like f full of pillars. It's a nice place for a meeting. Uh, it, it's like you feel like you're in uh, Acropolis or kind of thing. And so that's a nice, lovely column, uh, column based uh, uh, architecture. And Jesus walked in a temple in Solomon, Solomon Port. So it was a very scenic place. It was there. Then the Jews surrounded him. When he was there, they surround him and said, How long do you raise doubts in our soul? If you are the Christ, tell us openly. Tell us plainly, boldly, freely. And Jesus actually told them, remember all this revolve around the temple. I told you, and you believe not. I actually told you, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Jesus referred to the miracles. And now, Jesus gives them an offer. He says, but you believe not because you are not of my sheep. See, he says, it's, it's a funny reason. He says, we think that we believe, then we became sheep. But Jesus said, no, you're sheep first, that's why you believe. Ha! Look at it, look at the sentence. He says, you, you don't believe because you're not my sheep. Implying if you're my sheep, then you believe. So it looks like when you were born again and became a sheep, you receive a faith organ. A faith organ. An ability to believe God. What we call a measure of faith. That will cause you to respond to God's word and all you want to do is, I believe. Now remember, you believe because it's your nature to believe. And Jesus says, you don't believe because you don't have a nature of a sheep. Correct? He said, you're not my sheep. Because he didn't say, are your goats, camels, or maybe some other thing. He says, you are not believing because you don't have a nature. So when I look at that, I say, ha. Ah, there's something about nature to believe in. And if right now you're finding yourself a skeptic and don't believe easily, that nature is not a shit nature. There's either a good nature trying to come up, or some donkey nature, or some one animal nature, or some camel. Let's not condemn camels, they might be nice creatures. But some other nature is coming out. Ah, because the sheep nature, when the sheep hear the voice of Jesus, remember the voice, the Rema, the Logos, when they hear, the sheep say, oh, the sheep know his voice. The sheep start worshipping. Oh, there is a nature of believing. There is, a, there, is, there is an attitude of a nature in your heart that helps you to believe easily. And actually, if you don't believe things easily, you're not allowing the sheep nature to come out. You're allowing some leopard nature. That's why the Bible says, can the leopard change its spots? <laughs> or some wrong nature that needs to come forth. Let me point to the scriptural doctrine on that. In Romans chapter uh, 12. In Romans chapter 12, he says, when he talk about different gifts that God operate, he says in verse 3, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That is the donkey nature, the sin nature, or the good nature. Let's call it the good nature. The good nature start thinking, I'm better than everybody else. Finish. Uh. There's no more sheep. Sheep never think that way. So watch your thoughts that are coming, that, that, that go through your mind. 
A sheep does not think that way. Sheep is always symbol of also softness and meekness. As, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. The measure of faith that makes you a sheep gives you the ability to believe God. It is the organ of faith. It is an ability to easily believe. When it comes to God's thing, look, look at it. The sheep can hear his voice. The sheep go in and out. Jesus is the door. Jesus walks in front of them. Uh, Jesus says, I know them and, 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 and my own know me. So, and my sheep hear my voice uh, and, and don't hear the voice of a stranger. All these are based on nature nature that we must allow the new nature to come out something that makes it easy to believe let's continue on that but okay let's get back the side by side comparison to john gospel john where are you oops i'm going wrong, wrong chapter 10 okay not many uh, verses in this chapter so it's a good timing and um, John chapter 10, yes. So here when they tell him, tell us plainly. Uh, and Jesus says uh, to them, uh, yeah, okay. Are we there? Okay. The works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness on me. In other the miracles. But you believe not, you believe not because you are not on my sheep. Oh. Jesus, as I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, he emphasized, and I know them. Now, this hearing is voice he'll be talking from the earlier chapters, earlier verse. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and forever they will never, ever. Let me see, the other translation must be by no means, by, by no means again. Uh, Oh, did he even say anything in verse 28? I give them eternal life. And then they didn't translate the word forever. Something wrong. They, they, they're missing things in this translation. See, in uh, synchronized verses, we are looking at uh, verse 28. Mm. And uh, so I put the Greek out. And you see this part here. This is the double negative, which is who may. There is a never ever perish. You know? And here is the whole sentence never translated. I don't know where they got the word never. This is not never. This is into the ages or forever and ever. Not never. This is forever and ever. So they never translate this point. Huh? They're missing a lot of things inside. And so that's why we translate it as uh, what's our translation. And I give them eternal life. And forever. It's forever. Into the ages. They will never ever perish. Hallelujah. Jesus is saying, once you are safe, it's very hard to get lost. Unless some people are not safe in the first place. <coughs> so Jesus says, <coughs> forever, because I have given them eternal life. <coughs> By right, they should never be lost. Unless they never receive it in the first place. They might be pretending to be sheep. Maybe they could be goats in sheep's clothes. <laughs> that would be something new. And they never receive a change of nature. Jesus said, if you actually receive a change in nature, there is what he calls security or salvation. Something in you prevents you from getting lost. They will never ever perish. Neither will anyone and may I say also anything snatch them out of my hand 
because Jesus and the sheep are very close. I know them, they are mine. You must know the story of the 99 sheep and the one sheep, right? How precious. I pray tonight, if you're hearing this word, you will realize how precious you are. Look, Jesus, actually Jesus never once left the sheep without his presence. Remember, he, he tucks you in, takes you out, he is the door, you're going through him in and out, and then every day he brings you back, and remember, he's omnipresent. No wonder Jesus says, Lo, I am with you unto the end of the age. You think that he left you. Sometimes you don't feel him. And of course, many of us don't see him. But I can tell you, he is there. He's right there wherever you are, any part of the world. He has never left you. If you are really, 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 truly, truly following Jesus, Amen, Amen. His sheep, He actually holds you dearly. Remember Jesus says, He will not even let one hair to fall down without him knowing. So the next time you go bathing and you see a clump of hair, of course, if it's a clump of hair, please, you could be either vitamin B deficiency <laughs> or zinc deficiency, mineral deficiency. So please up that. But I think you're allowed to drop a few hairs every day, I think 40 or so. So, if you see those hair dropping, Jesus say, not even one hair drop without him knowing. He says, all your hair is numbered. So think about how much he cares for us. I pray tonight you catch a vision of how close Jesus is with you, but you're not so close with him. Jesus said, I know them. And my own know me. See, he emphasized those who are owned by him. But some sheep, uh, Jesus wants to own them. Say, no, 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 I, I am, are you, are you? I give you just this little room in my heart, the rest all my, my, my. Jesus don't own you. But if you let him own you, 100%, 1000%. You will feel his closeness. It is us that never welcome his presence. Remember, ownership by Jesus is 100%. If you hold anything back, and here, here, is, here is a solution to your problem. If you hold back 80%, you will only experience 20% of Jesus' presence. We experience the presence of Jesus in our life according to the proportion we surrender. If you really surrender 100%, you will sense, in your own way, His presence all the time. And that's why every day you must make sure you keep yourself surrendered. Because you could be 100% last week, but this week some distraction came, you might be 50%. If you can watch one area in your life, make sure every day you're a hundred percentile in Jesus. Nothing is held back from Him. You're guaranteed His presence. Then the Obed-Edom effect can take place. They will never ever perish. No one can snatch them. Wow, He really protects you. My Father who gave them to me. Actually, he made a covenant and he owns us. It's greater than all. And again, he emphasized, and no one is able to snatch, seize, snatch, take them out of my father's hand. Double. So you think, 
one sheep can get lost? No. Which is why if you really help people to come to Jesus and get them surrendered and born again, it's almost a guarantee they cannot get lost anymore. As long as they surrender 100%. Unfortunately, surrendering to Him is a free choice, which He never forced on us. If you sing the song that He is your shepherd, let Him be a hundred percent shepherd. So we go on. Verse 30, we only got about, you know, 10, 12 verses left. Then He says, in verse 30, I and my Father are one. Yes. Now, this he used a masculine oneness. I and my Father are one. And Okay, I was wondering whether I'm going to highlight that. Okay, let, let's, let's re read on on that. Um, I'm going to emphasize, let me see, highlight it. Okay. Highlight the one. Mm. Well, the color should be up, but we are only interested. Gospel of John. Okay, Mark Luke. John, chapter 10. Mm. Okay, we got John 10, here we are, <clears throat> in John 10, the word one occur many times, I need to punch this in to get all of it in, one, two, three, four, five, six, six times, six times, yes. So let me punch it in. Ta-da! Okay, now it's highlighted for you. By the hiring he who is not the shepherd, one, okay, that one is obviously a different, not the numerical one. Uh, it's more in the English but not in the Greek. One flock, see one flock? Uh, that is numerical one flock. It's the word mia. Mia, which is a feminine. One flock. So he's talking about, uh, and then here one shepherd. Can you see the two different ones? One is a mia, one is a highest. Both are numerical one. And when he when he referred to us, he referred to us with the word mia, uh, a sort of softer feminine one. We are his bride. When he referred many times to the Trinity, highs, the, the numerical one is emphasized, a masculine. There's a masculine one and a numerical one. But the, the, the highest one is a strong one, which means uh, is a very strong masculine one, which is why verse 30, verse 30 is where you say, I and my Father are one. We are part of each other's trinity in different dimension. Masculine. Whereas the sheep, that is the oneness of all believers. Remember, other sheep have I from a different courtyard. But they are the same kind of sheep. So the sheep need their own oneness. Jesus says this. Among themselves is a different display they got once. Now let's look at verse 31, getting interesting. The moment he said, I and my father are one, they take up stones again to throw. Who are these Jews? They took up stones. And it's already in their hand. And then Jesus answered, Many good works I have shown you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? Healing the blind man? Healing the lame man? Healing the paralyzed man, all these miracles, for which one are you going to stone? And then they reply, for a good work we stone you not, but for blasphemy, they say, 
And because you being a man make yourself God. Ha! They cannot stand that Jesus said, I and the Father are one. He and the Father are one. Do you know whenever you say that you and the Father are one, you are claiming to have God-like qualities? That's what the Jews understood. When you say, I and my Father are one, God-like qualities. That means all of the nature of God is in you. They regard that as a blasphemy. And Jesus has come to bring us to the level of oneness with God. Hallelujah. Only to us, humankind, we form like the fourth unity. There is a trinity. Then when He is fully in us, correct, what is the God dimension? There is Father God dimension because there is the uncreated where God feels everything. Then there is uh, the Word dimension because the Word created everything. Then there is a Spirit dimension because He filters into everything. And then there is the church dimension where he inhabits, he lives inside the church and the church become like bricks that bricks and mortar that show forth the temple of God it is like God was waiting to manifest a fourth dimension of himself a fourth angle of trinity that hasn't been seen that will now be seen through the church. So from the beginning of time when he created the human race, he wanted the human race to show forth something about him. A dimension of him that no angel, no other creature could have. So God has set it aside for the God dimension. How precious. That's why the Jews cannot take it. Because at that point, do you notice when the reaction is? Now try to imagine. This is not just their reaction. This is Satan reacting. They were already, you know, uh, a demon. Because it takes a demon to call another person a demon. <laughs> so they were already demonized, accusing Jesus of having a demon. So they already, all their stirring, all these are, they are actually influenced by demons. But when Jesus makes a statement uh, that will cause them, the, every demon, and, 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 and if, if Satan and demon got hair, every of their hair to stand up. <laughs> that statement was one of the biggest. And suddenly they start taking stop. Wow! their anger came out but not just not just the anger from Satan and all that all the hatred came out which is why the next time you see if you sing about your oneness with God you say Father we are one with you and we are one with another it's a powerful theme that frightened the demon until the demon Malay say, terkejut. <laughs> right. Shock. Didn't the Bible say in Psalms 133, when brethren dwell together in unity, oh, it frightens them. Think about it. What other thing did Jesus say? If any two of you on the earth agree as to anything, Whatever they lose on earth, it's loose in heaven. They burn on earth, burn on The earth starts being heaven. Satan is afraid of unity. 
He's afraid when husband and wife are fully in agreement because they are powerful. He's afraid when two believers are in agreement because they are powerful. He's afraid when the church is in agreement. He's afraid when one individual becomes one with God. He is so afraid. And that's what makes him angry. So now you know the weak spots of Satan. Sing more songs about you and Jesus being one. Confess more. Be more one with another person. One chase a thousand, two chase ten thousand. Oh, that is why Satan employ the plastic tree. You know who the plastic tree is like? The fallen angel. His specialty is to go into enemy camp invisibly and cause division. So you must resist the attempts of the enemy to divide your faith. To chop a group that is in oneness into pieces. And think about that. Let's say you got a group of five, seven, eight or ten people praying and they're very one. And every time you pray, oh, even if he try his sunglasses made from hell, he still burn a hole. He cannot stand the light. And there's no weapon he can throw against it. He can shoot every missile. It is just like sending a missile into the sun. The sun is already a nuclear explosion. <laughs> what do you think it will do? The sun will just, oh, delicious. Then nothing, you know, can you burn the sun? No! It just takes everything and burn. But if he can make this group disagree, put a tail bearer, put a negative person, and always he starts dividing the group, casting down. Suddenly the bright light of the sun goes, until people say, hey, is that a light or is that some candle? Understand. See the action behind it. And then they say, you being a man make yourself God when you want. Jesus said, is it not written in your law? I say, you are gods. If we call them gods to whom the word of God or the logos of God came, and the scripture cannot be destroyed, he whom the Father sanctified, sent to the world, do you say of him, you blaspheme because I am, because I say I am the Son of God. And then Jesus challenged them. Verse 37. If I do not do the works of my Father, believe me not. You don't have to believe me. But he says, But if I do, though you believe not, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I Him. Do you know, realize that what Jesus is saying? Okay, how are Jesus' works performed? Oneness with God. If one man or one woman or one child can live their whole life so one with God, you will do great works on the earth. The key is simple. Oneness with God. Not some great doctrine. Wow, I need to go uh, to theologize. Uh. I need another 20 theologizations before I do America. No, 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 no. It's good to theologize. He <laughs> say, oh, I got to discover another 40 principles. Ah, you know, maybe I only understood 400. The other guy understood 4,000. No wonder they're more powerful than me. Knowing the principles are good. Knowing God is good. But the simplicity of oneness with God is all it does. 
Just let God be in you and you be in God. Focus and meditate on being one with God. And you will know how powerful you are. That's all. Not some complicated doctrine. And that's why I wrote in my fatherly tongue, every morning when you get up, look up. Look in. Then look out. Simple, right? Don't forget that. So this morning, did you look up? No, pastor. For God. You must make it a habit. Remember? You're not supposed to get up except through the door. So pretend that you're in sheep fold when you're sleeping. So when you get up, who's your door? Jesus. So your thoughts must be Jesus. Uh, you go through. When you're one with God, is the key to everything. After Jesus made the church, Jesus was very generous, you know. He said, if my oneness doesn't result in something you can see in works, you don't have to believe me. But now that you got works, ha, huh, you better believe. If you don't believe, something bad. Judgment is coming. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he came forth out of their hand, which means that actually they tried to catch him. They tried to take him. But somehow, when Jesus walked, it's like they cannot come near him. It's like they go, and Jesus just walked. They couldn't lay hands on him. Something supernatural. That is a supernatural protection. And went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized. There he abided. You know, Jesus, he went quiet time. Because by that time, John was already gone. But remember, that is a place where very few people go. And, and so he went there to a solitary place, a quiet place away from everyone. He actually went there to meditate, to be alone. But, he says, many came unto him and said, John did no sign, but all things that John spoke of, this man, were true. They were true. And the last verse, unfortunately, he went to the next line. This line and many, yay, believe in him. So his ministry was effective. Powerful and effective. We learn a lot of things today. That you keep calling yourself sheep. If you are not an intimate sheep, man, you're God lah. <laughs> and you know goats are very individualistic. And you know this. Although goats can travel quite a few at a time, but goats like to be a lone one. But sheep, man, they travel and mass. The molecules flowing together. So the next time we sing about us being sheep, imagine a very tender, loving moment with Jesus. And the whole chapter is leading to this, that Jesus and the Father, ah, they are so one. So do you have tenderness and oneness with God? Every day. Do you every day project to God? Even sometimes you cannot talk out loud. You project, God, I really love you. God, you know, and every day when you see all the creation of God, you say, wow, God, you love me so much. I love you. Praise the Lord. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we pray that you take us into your hands. Show us, Lord, all your goodness and mercy all the joy that you have for us, your tenderness, Lord. And we know what is preventing people. Like you said, we must take authority over our soul. Our soul part is preventing us from being spiritually one with God. And our soul must be laid down like Jesus. 
because the soul will keep preventing unity with God and with people. Although the people in the book of Acts, their soul did become one, but it was a trained soul and a renewed soul. Thank you, Father. You show us your grace and mercy. Oh, let the Son of God and for you with His Spirit and His love let Him fill you love each one. Uh, Jesus, we know even if one sheep is lost, you will go all the way to look for that one sheep. Because you being our shepherd is actually you being our lover. You love us so much, so tenderly, and you whisper your voice into our hearts and lives. So teach us to regard you as the love of our love the life of our life and the Father who loves us so tenderly as He loves you, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your love. Seal this knowledge and bring everyone into oneness with God and oneness with each other. 
not just the oneness, perfect oneness. Perfect oneness in all of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap, offering.